My name's Anna Yeaman. I'm the creative director at Style Campaign. Besides a, a quick explanation of what responsive email design is, I'll take a look at what's possible going through some of the responsive layout patterns we've deployed. Uh, I've also got a section on tablets, touch, performance, and techniques for dealing with clients that don't support media queries. I'll finish up by looking at responsive email testing. So currently 41% of emails are opened on a mobile device, and that includes tablets, by the way. And Notice predicts that by the end of this year, most marketers will exceed 50%. That's without taking image blocking into account, so those numbers will be higher. You may have already reached that tipping point. We've one client at 58% um, and another at 27%, both retail but with very different demographics. Um, so it's important the first thing you do is gather your own mobile stats. If your ESP isn't providing that breakdown for you, then check out Litmus or Return Path. So not only are we seeing an incredible amount of mobile growth, but only 2% of users will reopen your email on another device. So you just for one shot, you know, they're not going to go back to their desktop and, and look at it there. The challenge is how to mobile optimize when there's thousands of screen sizes, with new devices being released all the time. And we can't design multiple builds for each platform or form factor. It would just drive us nuts. It would just be impractical. So if we were to use a, a fixed width scalable template, just how wide should it be? While the iPhone automatically scales emails to the width of the screen, as you can see on the left, Android only shows the, the top left-hand corner. Even on 7-inch tablets like the, the Kindle Fire, which you can see here, um, any fixed width layout over 500 pixels gets clipped. So you can see that the whole right-hand side is, is clipped off here. Um, and if you go skinny, you could get called out by a, a smartphone or, or even a, a smablet that we have here, which is the uh, Galaxy Note. Uh, Blackberry clips, even the, the surface clips. So there's this horizontal hierarchy to consider with fixed width layouts um, on platforms other than iOS. Uh, unless your template is around 300 pixels wide, uh, the right hand side will get chopped off somewhere. Now one way to, to force the creative to fit the screen is to use responsive design techniques. Now on the left we have the scalable template which is fixed width pixels and on the right we have a responsive layout. Now here it is displayed on six different Android devices. Um, as it's responsive it now shows um, you know, the full width rather than just the top left hand corner. Now responsive design it's not just for, for Android or, or Blackberry, it also benefits iOS users. So while this layout could work quite well, you know, if we left it as a scalable layout, and we can take it a step further so that the logo is clearer and the buttons are the right size for touch. You know, we can also drop from three columns down to two, making it easier to see the detail in the product photos and read the copy. So it just gives us a, an extra layer of control. I actually have this template. So uh, right now, this is um, a fixed width template. So this is what um, desktop users would get. So Outlook, Gmail, desktop Gmail, anyway. Um, but as soon as you go onto a, a smaller screen size, you can see here that it starts to change. It starts to scale. So desktop, change, 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 until it hits a break point. And then it changes to a, a two-column layout, So you can see here. Um, so it drops down from three columns on the desktop to two on mobile. And we also center the logo, get rid of some of the pre-header text, and we drop down to two buttons here so that they're the right size for touch. So it just gives us greater control. And what happens, you know, no matter what device you open it on, it doesn't matter what its viewport width is. Because the, the whole thing is fluid, um, you know, it will nicely fit the screen size. We go back to desktop. So it just takes it to the next level, gives us you know, that extra bit of control over all the elements in the, in the design. So what exactly is responsive email design and, and how does it all work? So responsive design was coined by Ethan Marcodi and it's made up of three components, fluid grids, fluid media, and, and by fluid media we're mostly talking about fluid images and CSS media queries. As you switch from the desktop to a mobile device, the email automatically adjusts its layout. So, you know, in effect, it responds to the environment in which it's being viewed. 
Like many designers, I was familiar with fluid layouts, and this is where the content is defined in percentages rather than fixed width pixels. But media queries were something entirely new to me. You know, it sees three elements working in tandem which make it so robust. So whilst the, the fluid coding scales elements up or down like an accordion, so for instance, the, the hero image in this template you can see is fluid. The fact that it's changing size is because it's defined in percentages. It's got nothing to do with media queries. Um, what, what the media queries do is they keep the fluid layout in check. So for instance, once this layout starts to get a bit squashed as we scale it down, it's right there as the media query is basically saying, OK, let's go from a, a three-column layout to a two-column layout. You know, or it allows you to hide an image or, or increase the font size. So Ethan outlined his approach in this A List Apart article in May 2010 and then later in the book Responsive Web Design. You know, though my first introduction to media queries was through this campaign monitor article showing how Panic used media queries to mobile optimize their emails. Um, you know, we started our own research shortly after reading this and it, you know, it's surprising to think how long ago that is now. Um, I had a lot of questions back then, like what parts of the design was I able to change, you know, what are the limitations, and you know, how does it all work? I remember Graham, my husband, saying to me, you know, there's no app media equals iPhone. In other words, the, the design changes aren't triggered by the platform it's opened on, like iOS versus Android, but by the screen properties of the device. So most commonly we do a check against the viewport width. Now, this isn't to be confused with the screen size. So, for instance, the, the Kindle Fire has a screen size of 800 by 1280. So you'd think that most email creative would fit the screen, um, but it doesn't because the viewport is only 533 pixels wide. So the screen size and the viewport are, are two different measurements. Uh, the email client leaves small margins on either side, you can see here. Um, so the actual visible area is slightly less, so it's around 500 pixels in this case. Um, this template is 640 pixels wide. Um, if we left it fixed width like you see here, um, the whole right-hand side would get chopped off. So the code looks like this. We use a max width, which queries the viewport, rather than a max device width, which queries the screen size. Now, all it's really saying is if the viewport is below 480 pixels, then change the layout like this. The point at which the media query is triggered, in this case 480 pixels, is called a break point. You know, it's the point at which your fluid layout gets strained and breaks, basically, and, and you can have multiple breakpoints in one template. Now, breakpoints have always reminded me of keyframes in an animation with the, the fluid code taking care of the in-betweens. By themselves, fluid layouts will only get you so far. At some point, the content is going to become strained. You know, for instance, line lengths will get too long. Um, and this is where you'd insert a breakpoint so that you can adjust the layout. So really, responsive design is just a, a series of checks and balances, or, or if-then statements. So to recap, it's one HTML file that's delivered to all platforms, with a nice mixture of fluid elements and, and media queries to keep it all in check. Now, one term that you might have come across is adaptive layouts, and this isn't to be confused with adaptive design, which is something else again. Adaptive layouts are, are when you switch between two or more fixed width layouts using media queries, but you leave out the fluid code in. So most adaptive layouts consist of two states, desktop and mobile. You could design more than two, but you know, it would get really time consuming. So going back to the idea of a, a responsive design being one long animation, an adaptive layout would be like jumping from one keyframe to another and bypassing the in-betweens. So it's probably easier if I, um, if I try and show you instead. So uh, this Costco template is an adaptive layout. And you can see here that right now it's desktop, 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 boom, switches to mobile. So basically it has two states. Let me scroll down two states all the way through. Whereas if we look at um, this Hugo Boss template, we can see that it um, has a fluid component to it. So you know, every time we change the screen, every time we you know, tweak the browser, the layout changes. So you know, potentially this has you know, far more states than what we just saw. 
Now we've developed both uh, adaptive and responsive templates, and responsive templates can take longer to develop, but the tr transitions are more fluid. Um, I don't feel you have to go fully responsive just in order to prove a point. Um, in all likelihood, an adaptive layout will cover the majority of your needs. Um, out of necessity, many email templates are hybrids of the two anyway. They're both fixed width and fluid. The main consideration with an adaptive layout is at what point do you flip the switch between desktop and mobile? So going back to this one. So, so at which point, at which screen width do we want to go from this template to this template? You know, typically you'd, you'd switch at common breakpoints like 480 pixels for the iPhone. But if you set your breakpoint at 480, then 7-inch tablets will get the desktop build. So it will be desktop, desktop, and it will still be desktop here. And it's only when we get down to sort of the iPhone size that it would switch. Um, more recently, we've been setting a breakpoint much sooner um, so that 7-inch tablets get the mobile version. So basically, as soon as you get off the desktop, boom, it switches to mobile. This is the section I, I wish I had a while back outlining many of the responsive layout patterns we've deployed. I call this a, a context switch template as we're not just adjusting the layout but also the content depending on the device it's opened on. We developed this template last summer for prep sports and, and there are two separate hero modules in the code. So this section here and here. They're totally self-contained with different images, HTML copy and links, which gives you complete control over both environments. Even the alt text is different. So when viewed on the desktop, the mobile module is hidden and vice versa. Let me just quickly show you this. So you can see here that this template allows you to test different treatments of the same offer to desktop versus mobile users. Um, because this image didn't scale down very well, you lost a lot of the detail in the hoodie image. Instead, we, we put a crop. and We put more of a close-up image in the mobile build. And we've also altered the HTML copy. You can see it's HTML. It's not just a, an image swap. So here it says custom hoodies. And on the desktop build, it says comfort you can count on. So, you know, user context might lead you to prioritize certain content. So one simple use case would be to place a store locator or a search bar in a more prominent position in the mobile build. Now, okay, I'm not saying that you should, <laughs> but just that you could have a totally different offer. So hoodies for desktop users and baseball gear for mobile, each with different creative and landing pages. So let me show you this one. As you can see, it's exactly the same template as we just saw. It's just that we've put a different offer in the mobile module. So there you can see this one here is uh, for hoodies, and this one here is for baseball gear. And it kind of stacks that content under there. So, um, OK, so if we click on the hoodies URL, it takes us to We Have Your College. So that's that landing page. And then when we go back to the mobile view and we click tap for gear, it takes us somewhere else. It takes us to a vintage uh, team apparel. You'll also notice that we've um, altered the, the call to action to say tap for gear on the mobile version. So even small tweaks like using device specific copy can, uh, you know, can increase click through rates and, and using things like a, a click to call button as well. It's also worth pointing out that the mobile layout doesn't have to mimic the desktop build in any way. So you know, in the previous examples, we had the, the title running along the top, and then we had the call to action button underneath. So they kind of looked a little bit similar. Um, essentially, you can put anything you like in this space. Um, here we've got a, a mobile friendly list view with multiple offers, each with a different landing page. So you could even have a, a handful of different um, mobile hero modules that were all interchangeable. You know, this template makes you consider the, the mobile context and whether or not mobile users um, respond better to different types of offers, different language, different imagery. So while the myth of being constantly on the go is outdated, you know, I do think mobile users can benefit from, say, shorter copy or a reduced feature set or an altered content hierarchy. We're not building websites with a, a long shelf life where users rightly expect consistency between each experience. As both Litmus and, and Notice have reported, only 2% of emails get read on more than one device, so the chance of someone seeing both layouts are, are very slim. Here's another example where we're changing both the layout and the content depending on the device it's viewed on. 
So in order to keep Android Gmail users happy, I placed this left-hand column in our, in our style campaign template. Let's see here. Let me just bring this up. Um, the reason for that is in Android Gmail, um, where it doesn't support media queries, you just see the top left-hand corner of the desktop build, and, and obviously I wanted there to be some content in there. So, you know, whilst it was a, a good call in terms of accessibility, it's, it's not so great from a developer's standpoint. As you'll see, most column drops are from the right, and in order to get this template to work, we ended up with two columns that we could switch out for desktop and mobile users. Um, by the way, you can do column drops from the left. There were just um, complications with this build. A happy side effect, though, is um, just like with the prep template, I can serve different content to desktop and mobile users. So I can A, B test, say, different blog posts, different call to actions, and see how they perform. Um, maybe add a click to call button just in the mobile column. So let me quickly show you this. So on the desktop build, you can see here it says grid of grim, default preview area, blah, 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 Android grid. And then when we scale this template for mobile users, this is really the, the iPad view and, and the mobile view. If we go down and look at that column, which we've just now moved from the left-hand side to, to underneath, it says, yep, I'm mobile. And obviously, this is just for, for demonstration purposes. And place whatever copy you like in here just for mobile users to see. And then the call to action also says, tap me, please. So we've changed it. And we can change out the, the ones underneath. I just did one because I'm being lazy. But just to, just to show you. And let me, um, and it's also the URLs. So here, if we click on Android Grid, I think it just takes you to our home page. Whereas if we go down to, to this column here and we click Tap Me Please, it takes you to our YouTube page, just, just to show you how it, how it differs. So one thing that um, Graham pointed out to me is, um, he coded the buttons differently for in each column as you've got support for things like border radius or mobile um, whereas on desktop he had to use images on you know on the end of the call to action buttons um, so as well as being able to serve different content you can take full advantage of, of you know all the cool stuff that only mobile supports like live forms in email video click to call or CS3 animations you know because you know that module is only being exposed to mobile users you know you don't have to worry about Outlook for a tantrum you can just put whatever you you want in that module. Um, you do have to keep track of file size with this technique though. I mean while you could I wouldn't advise swapping one whole layout out for another but just showing and hiding small key modules. It could be as simple as swapping the, the, call, to action, the call to action so it displays different copy and URLs. Um, as our column was entirely in code as you can see here, um, it really didn't add much to the file size to have two. And, and with prep, a fair amount of their template was HTML based, which helped to kind of mitigate the cost of adding a second hero image. For Rackspace, the main focus of their redesign was to deliver a better mobile experience to their customers. While their previous newsletter had some mobile friendly aspects, it was skinny at only 480 pixels wide and it had plenty of HTML copy. They wanted to further optimize it using a, a responsive design. The new template had to perform well not just on iOS but across a whole range of mobile platforms. Um, as you can see, it's uh, let me just show you, it's fluid. So it fits the width of whichever viewport it's displayed on and it, and it doesn't matter which orientation you're holding the mobile device in. It goes down to, I think, around 235 pixels. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty narrow. So you can see all the way down. So the content modules either wrap or, or stack. So you can see here we've got the, the two columns. And when it gets too narrow, it just stacks them into one column and, and then it goes fluid again. And the same with the developer tools. These were two column layouts and they stack down to one. Events. And then the survey. So there's nine different modules such as uh, the survey which you can see here. There's events, blog posts. Um, you know, although they won't use them all at once, they can select which modules they need for different mail-ins and, and they can also reorder them. Although iOS and, and Android dominate their stats, we also did some testing on BlackBerry and Windows Phone. 
Mobile opens can only be logged if images are enabled, and, and as BlackBerry blocks images by default, its numbers are, are heavily underrepresented. Although Android suffers from the same problem, and at least has a, a show pictures button sort of right within reach, with BlackBerry you have to navigate to, the, to a menu to get images, so you click on this button, which brings up this menu. Um, it then prompts you again when you say get images, effectively saying, are you sure you want to do that? So there's all these hoops that BlackBerry users have to jump through. And that's one of the reasons there are a few images in this redesign, because Rackspace has a, has a very technical audience and they expect fast access to information, no matter which device they're on. So we relied heavily on typography, contrast and colour to break the content down into digestible chunks. One of the few areas where we, where we did use images was to place an arrow between each section to encourage scrolling. We also added a scroll for more styled out text to, to the little arrow images. So don't discount the long scroll on mobile unless you've tested it. And while you do want engaging content on the first screen, tablet users are, are in a more leisurely mindset. Another way to mitigate the long scroll is to use anchor tags. This is where you click on a link and it jumps down to that section in the content. Rackspace's old template had anchor tags. Let me quickly show you. So these were anchor tags in the black area here. Though as you can't track their usage, we, we didn't have any data to tell us if they were being used or not. So what we did is we built one version with the redesign that had jump tags, um, which you can see here, uh, and another version without, and, and they A-B tested them. The theory was that the version with jump tags would see more engagement, or at least a more even distribution of clicks kind of further down the page. Anchor, anchor tag support was actually quite strong, not universal, but it was a lot better than I had thought. Um, you know, it's actually supported in Outlook and Gmail, including Android Gmail. Um, so Rackspace ran the tests, and the version without anchor tags had higher engagement. Um, the, the, you know, there's no such thing as an unsuccessful test. You always learn something. You know, there's so many unknowns with mobile email. You have to constantly be testing and refining. Though when compared with their old skinny layout, users did engage with the content further down the page. So at least the arrows and the use of spacing and color had a, a positive impact on scrolling. Not only do Rackspace have strong smartphone numbers, but also very high tablet engagement. So, you know, what we've been doing for a while now is designing the tablet layout for touch rather than for a cursor. And that was one of the key things that was really missing from their old layout. You can see how hard it was to accurately hit one of the read links in the blog section. You know, they were just too small and too closely spaced. Instead of trying to, you know, peck at tiny links, we wanted users to have, you know, big touch targets. So to that end, we, we linked up whole strips of content. The minimum that Apple recommends is 44 by 44 pixels, um, though we exceeded that throughout this redesign. You know, you want the reading experience to be a, a comfortable one where users aren't anxious about mishaps. You know, they shouldn't have to be, you know, swipe left or right in order to read a line of copy or, or zoom in on tiny, tiny fonts. Rackspace have, have a lot of great content, probably more than you'd read in one sitting. So Cameron Urie, who is the marketing manager at Rackspace, had the idea to test read later links. So you click on a link and it saves the article for reading later, either on the desktop or, or on a mobile. And with any mobile email, it's really important to test what happens, you know, after the click. And firstly, I wanted to know, do the Instapaper links, links even work? You know, where does it redirect you to? And is the whole experience mobile optimized? You know, this was one of those instances where being able to test on real devices was really useful because I was able to go and install Instapaper and, and run a series of tests. Rackspace were able to track how the read later links performed and, and it seemed their customers really liked them. Over 10% of the clicks were for the read later option. And what I really like about them is it puts the customer in control of, of when and how they read your content. We also edited their copy down by more than half and increased the font size to a minimum of 16 pixels on the desktop. That way it doubles up for tablet and Android Gmail users. Further testing might show that just the article titles are enough for mobile users. So, you know, for instance, mobile users would just get this title and you could just hide the subcopy. You know, it's, it's just hard to know how much teaser copy you need. It's just something you have to test. It can be really hard to balance, you know, concise copy while maintaining the right brand voice. One bit of feedback we had from another project was that condensed copy just doesn't sound friendly enough and that when you leave out all the niceties, it just sounds too abrupt. 
you know, then there are copies with multiple stakeholders and they're all feeding you copy, you know, or there's even legal requirements around copy. You know, so while I agree that less is more, you know, I've found with real world projects that copy length is just an ongoing challenge. Rackspace wanted to continually improve their newsletter by gathering subscriber feedback. So this was our, our first draft and after you, you vote you're taken to a thank you page um, where there's the option to answer more questions. So we started out using this scale of, of 1 to 10 which you know it had to be touch friendly because it was also going to be viewed on tablets. Uh, we then dropped down to 1 to 5 before discussing other options such as a, a happy, neutral or, or sad face. Finally, we went with this simple thumbs up, thumbs down. You know, it's a lot more intuitive than the 1 to 10 grade, with the added bonus that you really do get to vote with your thumbs. When Rackspace tested their responsive design against their old skinny control, their click-through rates doubled. Um, so, you know, their readers also gave the, the new design a thumbs up. Not all responsive projects are, are redesigns. With a retrofit, you don't start from scratch, but mobile optimize your existing desktop creative retaining much of the original design and, and code base. Australian retailer OO.com uh, approached us to retrofit their order confirmation email. It can be really hard to know which templates to, to mobile optimize first. Alfredo Caballero, who is the marketing manager at OO.com, chose their order confirmation email as it's one of the main revenue drivers in their program. So here's how it looked um, before and after the rework. So this is it before. As you can see, it was fluid up to a point, and then it would stop. It would become fixed in a two-column layout. So essentially, this would be what mobile users would get, and desktop users would get this depending on their browser width. And here's the rework. As you can see, it's, it's very similar. There are some you know, minor differences with the buttons down here, but Essentially, the, it, the look and feel of it's very, you know, more or less the same. But what happens when you get down to the narrow browser width is that it switches over into a, a one-column layout, as you can see. So, you know, the design hasn't really changed significantly. When we hit the recommendations in the right-hand column, it, it greatly increased legibility on the iPhone. So this is how it looked before because it was stuck in that two-column layout. And this is how it looks now as a responsive design because we've hidden this column. Now the team at OO are really vigorous testers, so the decision to hide the, the recommendations was based on data rather than convenience. Um, you know, they further test and may have us placing it underneath the primary content, possibly with just one or two recommendations as opposed to four. You can also see that we increase the font size from 13 pixels on the desktop up to 16 pixels on mobile. Now, iOS automatically scales copy up if it's less than 13 pixels, and this can lead to broken navigations and, and really squashed ugly footers. Um, so to disable uh, auto-scaling, you need to add this line of code, or, you know, just make your fonts bigger. The, the two columns in the old layer actually worked quite well on Android, as the main information was in the left row. So as you can see, it would just come in like this. Though having the right-hand column clipped um, you know, it was distracting and they preferred that we focus on the core content. You know, finally, some of the old headings were, were image-based, so they were getting blocked, for instance, in Android. So, you know, having it into a, a single column made it a lot cleaner on Android. And the orange headings are now in HTML, so they show with images off. Yeah, actually, the only images in this template are, are the logo at the top and the project thumbnails. The call to actions were originally image based as well, um, and because of the two column layout, they appeared tiny on the iPhone. You can just kind of look at them here <laughs> There's this green little speck and these two little buttons here. Um, so we turned them into bulletproof buttons on the desktop, uh, and then we scaled them to a width of the screen on mobile. So not only did it make them the right size for touch, but having them a the full width of the screen makes them easier to tap no matter which hand you're, you're holding the phone in. We also hid some of the, the secondary copy on mobile and just presented those actions as three buttons. 
AO.com chose to retrofit their main newsletter after the transactional emails, um, and they're currently testing different responsive navigation patterns as 15% of their sessions are, are generated from the navigation header. As Alfredo mentioned, you know, this small change to an existing template will gain them quick insights and help them plan larger optimizations. So, you know, you can start small, just pick one template with high mobile engagement stats or, or one that's a, a good performer, mobile optimize it, possibly retrofit it, you know, test and then review. Now, it's worth noting though that not all templates can be repurposed, you'll just need to evaluate them first. The desktop code has to be clean and compatible. The HTML could also be clean, but just not ideally structured. So for instance, deeply nested tables are, are quite a pain to work with. Um, you'll probably still need to tweak the, the desktop layout to account for touch, but it's definitely feasible that some templates can extend their shelf life this way. Now, I think retrofits are, are typically stop gaps on the way to more sweeping changes. They allow you to, to test the mobile waters before investing more resources. Some of my earliest responsive designs involved product grids. There are a lot of unknowns, like did we have to use divs or could we stick with tables? And while we'd manage to stack a, a two column layout, what about three or, or four columns? So in this section I'll go through some basic grid patterns. Let's begin with a two to one column. So the entire right hand side column, so this column here, drops below the left. Most column drops are from the right, so on mobile it will go one, two, three, four, five, six, so you can see. And this is the second column starts and it's just dropped below the first. And you'll also, also notice that the desktop fonts and buttons are, are mobile sized. So this is for both tablet and Android Gmail users. And we also added like a slight drop shadow to the thumbnail images to make them appear more touchable. So, you know, this is quite an old template. I designed this sort of a little over a year ago, and it's easily one of the more popular layout patterns because it, it also works so well in Android Gmail. Uh, this template displays in three columns when opened on the desktop and one when opened on a mobile device. It's the same content you just saw just uh, in the two-column layout. It's just rearranged. So you'll want to test different grid configurations like two-column versus three-column versus a list view. Instead of dropping the, the, the column from the right, this one takes it row by row. So on mobile, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, as opposed to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So let's have a quick look at this one. So it will go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, as you can see. So it drops from three columns all the way down to one. This is three column on the desktop and two column on mobile, and as you can see, it has a, a more fluid component to it than the other two, which are, are more adaptive. So it goes from three down to two. And I, I prioritize the product thumbnails over a text description in this template. You can see there's very little text. You know, many iPhone apps are, are image driven and they show either no copy at all, like in this example, or, or very little. When Zappos reworked their product pages, they hid the product description because a huge percentage of orders happened without anyone looking at it. So they said, we developed a, a hierarchy of what our customers want. They want images first, then they want to look at videos, and then they're looking at reviews. And all of these things were a higher importance level to the user than, than the product description. If we look at how Living Social's emails have evolved, we also see a, a clear trend away from text and towards images. So in the earliest example, the thumbnail images are, are secondary to the text. You know, there's very little contrast, the background's grey, the titles are grey. Now, in the middle example, the thumbnails are ever so slightly larger. Um, and they've introduced a, a little bit of contrast, but the grey boxes are now against white and the titles are blue. And, and today you can see that the thumbnails completely dominate the layout, with short blue titles which double up as links. You know, contrast is very high with the, the, the light grey on the dark grey background, and they've switched to a three-column layout. You know, but they've made sure that two rows fit nicely on the one screen. Now, when I designed this template, I made sure that each fashion tip, so you can see this section here, uh, fit on one iPhone screen. You know, al although the taller iPhone has been released, the number of products that fit the original screen height is still something that I take into consideration. 
Um, as the iPhone dominates Hugo Boss's mobile opens, which is currently around 60%, you know, I felt that this kind of extra level of care was warranted. Okay, so this is not strictly a product grid, <laughs> but it's just to show that you can start with a, a four column layout and drop down to two. This one here, so this template, you've got this four column layout, and it drops down to two on mobile. So the Costco project, you know, was, as I say, it was quite a while back. It was over a year old, and it, it started me thinking about how I'd mash up a, an organic layout with a, a traditional product grid. You know, regimented product, product grids didn't employ any of the usual tricks that we use, like the S-curve or arrows or dotted lines to draw the eye downwards. So, you know, my theory was by introducing some disorder and breaking up those horizontal lines, it would encourage users to scroll. So not long after, I came across masonry while looking for examples of what I had in my mind as disordered grids. And I mocked this up for, for Hugo Boss. So you get the idea that the grids are staggered and uneven on both the desktop and mobile. So, you know, I think it encourages scrolling and exploration. You know, more recently, we, we purchased a Surface tablet, which is full of uneven grid patterns. So here's a few things that you might want to test with uh, re responsive product grids. So thumbnail size, deals per screen, the amount of copy, button versus text call to actions, you know, just different column configurations like two column versus three columns. And, and also the mobile list view works really well. Staggered versus orders, you know, have a look where the, the scrolling drops off. So where do your clicks stop? Um, and also, look, you know, work on the contrast. Navigation can be one of the trickier aspects of a responsive design. These are the five patterns that I've used most frequently. Wrap is one of the more popular as it's easy to implement. You've just got to remember to add plenty of line height. It does take up valuable space though, forcing users to scroll to access the main content on mobile. You can see that it's uh, wrapped down onto three lines. Like wrap, stack was a, a pattern that you saw a lot of when responsive design first appeared, but it's lost a little bit of favor since as it can take up the whole of the first screen on mobile. Now for that reason, I tend to reserve this pattern for the footer. This JD Events template, um, we tried wrapping the links first, these down here, but stacking them was just so much cleaner. You can see here that they're stacked. Um, I guess another alternative would be to take a, a desktop navi that's positioned at the very top and then stack it underneath the main content on mobile so that it doesn't clog up that first screen. With Shift, you start with just three or four tabs on the desktop that are spaced for touch. So basically, it's however many tabs fit into, say, a 300 pixel wide area. Then you just shift it into place on mobile. It doesn't take up a lot of height, as you can see here. This is 44 pixels high on the desktop, um, you know, with plenty of width so that you can tap it on a mobile device. And you can see it just slots into place. Um, you know, it's still a favor of mine due to its simplicity, though the downside is it does limit you to just a few tabs. So reduce is where you start with, say, six tabs on the desk tape, and then you edit down to three on mobile. You know, usually it's the uh, first three desktop tabs that you pull in. So here we've got five tabs on the desktop, and then down on mobile, you know, we just, we just show the first three. The benefit is that you can have as many desktop tabs as you like, and the downside is that you know, you're just limited to three for mobile users. You know, many recent responsive sites like Microsoft and Disney have adopted a, a toggle navi. This is where the desktop navigation gets tucked behind a menu button on mobile, or sometimes it's depicted just as three lines. So a toggle allows you to have multiple desktop tabs while still remaining unobtrusive on small screens. The downside is it's, you know, it's the hardest to implement. Many desktop versions use JavaScript, which isn't supported in email clients. Now, after, after quite a bit of testing, we managed to get a, an email-friendly build up and running. It's worth pointing out that on a couple of occasions, we had builds that worked in the browser that used no JavaScript, but you know, they still didn't work in the email client. So it's really important to test this particular technique on real devices. So obviously you can style it to, to look however you like. So here on the desktop we've got five tabs and they're all exposed. And then when you go down to mobile, they're all tucked behind this menu link. And, and what happens on a mobile device is you, you tap the menu button and it reveals all, all the desktop links to you. Um, rather than push the content down the page with this particular um, demo, what happens is it overlays it. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so it's not bumping it down. There are many ways in which you can handle images within a responsive layout. These seven options are the ones I've used most often. The idea here is to keep all of your desktop images below 320 pixels wide. That way they don't need to be resized, just rearranged. It's based on the same principle as the shift navy pattern that we just saw. The downside is the images are fixed width. So on devices with viewports larger than 320, like some 7-inch tablets, you may see some white space around it. So for instance, this image here is 320 pixels wide. And if we were to scale it down to, say, the width of the iPhone, let me just move this across, you know, it would fit just perfectly. It would be like that. But if we were to view it on a 7-inch tablet, then the blue margin would begin to, to come through. It really just depends on your image and, and the type of layout that you're using. You know, the whole idea is it's a, a small fixed-width image that you don't have to crop or you don't have to um, make fluid. So a fluid image, though, is defined in percentages rather than fixed-width pixels. So if an image was set at 50%, it would always take up half the browser window. When we define responsive design as fluid grids, fluid assets, and media queries, by assets we're mostly referring to images. So the image in this template I'm about to show you is fluid. So this hero image here. Um, so it gets smaller as the, as the browser size reduces, as you can see. So you start out with a, a large desktop image, and then the browser is what scales it down for you, because it's always a percentage of the browser width. Um, so also, desktop file size is a consideration, because we're, we're not changing the file size, we're not swapping the image out, we're just making it smaller. Visual hierarchy is also something to consider, as on the desktop it's a, a big hero image. You can see when it's compared to the elements below. But once everything's in a single column, it can lose some of its impact because it's being scaled, you know, its width and its height is being reduced. So as you can see here. You also need to make sure that you retain image detail once it's scaled down. So you know, sometimes it might be easier to start with the mobile crop and then scale it back up, just so that you know mobile users get the right sized image. Sometimes you might find that a crop is more appropriate. So let me bring this one up. So here I wanted to maintain the height of the original desktop image, but just show the center portion on mobile. So we're just cropping the ends off, basically. Instead of scaling an entire image down like the fluid example, with overflow hidden, the browser crops the part of the image that doesn't fit on the screen. You can see here as the browser window gets smaller, you have to see on the far right here, it hides part of the image. So let me just bring this one up so you can see what I mean. So if you look to the very far right, we're using overflow hidden on this image here. Let me just see. So as the browser window reduces, it's cropping the image for us. So there wouldn't be, um, you know, there wouldn't be a scroll bar down the bottom. It's just cropping it. So this template actually uses a, a few techniques. It uses overflow hidden first on this far right end. And then when it hits tablet size, what we're actually doing, we're hiding that bit of the template on the right, the image. Um, and then we're switching over to a fluid image. Now, often you'll find that you'll use a combination, a combination of image techniques within the one template. So with this technique, you swap a desktop image for a mobile one. So let's just bring that up. So in this template, um, the desktop image would have taken up far too much height on mobile, so we swapped it for a smaller horizontal image. You can see that. So you have to be mindful when swapping images, as often both are downloaded, they're just not visible. This is where you hide a desktop image from mobile users. You know, it's, it's a really hard decision to make, because the argument goes, if, if a mobile user can do without an image or a, or a module, then why is it so essential to desktop users? So, in this template, we hid this image here on the far right for mobile users. You can see it just disappears. 
no image. Um, you know, it's a really tough call, though, isn't it? Um, you know, it does add personality to what is otherwise a, a lot of copy. Um, this was a retrofit, so I'm not sure if we would have done anything different had we been designing it from, for mobile from the outset. Dynamic images are, are a server-side solution. While there are many use cases, you know, what I think makes dynamic images unique is that they can tell us a lot about the user, I mean, the context of the user. So on open, they can check things like the time of day or the device or local weather, and from all of that contextual data, they generate an image. So for instance, the image on the right shows me holding a laptop and, and frowning into a webcam. That, that image is then being pumped into an email. There's also some dynamic text showing the time till midnight down here, and a, and a little cartoon sprite. And all of this has been assembled on open. If you look closely at State's user agent iPod, the word iPod is being clipped a little bit along the bottom. Um, device is just one of the parameters that you can use to target subscribers. But as we saw earlier, you can also deliver different images to desktop and mobile users via media queries. You know, it just depends on your, on your use case. Because, um, you know, dynamic images do come with an additional third-party cost, and they're obviously an image-based solution. You know, most emails have at least some HTML, even if it's just for pre-header and footer, and those elements will also need to adapt for mobile. So, you know, I've always thought a combination of dynamic images and responsive design is, is one possible solution. I'm often asked, what about tablets? Where do they fit into a responsive email design? According to a recent study by Perion, 55% said the tablet is their preferred reading device for emails, trialed by the desktop at 32%, and mobile phones at 10%. Obviously, tablets are a key part of any email strategy. Their context of use, touchscreen, and connection speeds make them distinct from the desktop and smartphones. So let's look at context. Google found that not only was email the number one activity on tablets, but that the most common locations for checking email were on the couch and in bed. Participants said that they used the tablet in bed because the form factor fits the relaxed setting. They used it just before they fell asleep and right after waking up. So either way, we're designing for people with tired eyes. You know, one of the things that I do when reading in bed is turn the screen brightness right down. You know, otherwise it's like a flashlight in my eyes. So you want to push the contrast and test your creative under a range of lighting conditions, from a dim bedroom to bright outside sunlight. You know, something that looks okay on the desktop can be really difficult to read once it's scaled down. It's not just the lighting that you have to consider, but distractions from the people around you, both at home and in busy public environments. You know, but mostly it's other devices that are fighting for our attention. This study by Google found that 75% of the time when we're using a tablet, we're also using another device, like the smartphone or a television. Email is the top activity for simultaneous screen usage at 60%. So we should be asking ourselves, how can we design for tired users with one eye on the TV? Apparently, people also like to eat and drink while checking email on tablets. So one-handed use is not just a, a smartphone consideration. Tablets also drive more web traffic because internet users prefer them for more in-depth visits, while smartphones are used for shorter visits. Adobe notes that overall page views and visits are 1.7 times higher on tablets. Looking at this research, it's, it's just no surprise that longer visits in a relaxed environment lead to higher engagement and sales. Fab CEO Jason Goldberg stated that the iPad has a significantly higher order value than the desktop or smartphones, and notice found that email click-to-open rates on tablets now outpace phones and are closing in on the desktop. So while the majority of tablet use occurs in the home, the workplace and cafes were also cited, though the most common out-of-home use was as a laptop replacement when people travelled. So I expect 7-inch tablets will be a lot more portable as they fit easily into a handbag. Henrik Muller, whose Google study I just referenced, predicted that 7-inch tablets will be more common than 10-inch soon as they're cheaper and more portable. You know, I just noticed at my local drugstore they're currently selling 7-inch tablets running Android 2.2 for just $88. But tablets use a touch screen instead of a cursor is the biggest differentiator to me as a designer. You have to consider size, spacing and positioning. Apple states that the comfortable minimum size of tappable UI elements is 44 by 44 points. I tend to try and be more generous, especially after observing my husband kind of timidly handling touch screens. 
The yellow buttons in this email are 83 by 58 pixels. Windows Phone suggests just 34 by 34 pixels, with at least 8 pixels between touchable controls. They recommend that you go larger if a touch target is close to the edge of the screen, as you risk accidentally hitting other controls. Spacing is often an issue. You know, I frequently encounter problems trying to use navigations and recovery footers on tablets. You can read the copy, but there's just not enough spacing to, to hit a link accurately. The iPad Mini, seen here on the left, shrinks everything down by a further 20% when compared to the original iPad on the right. As both tablets display the desktop version, you may want to increase your button size, spacing, and copy, you know, even further in order to compensate. The way we grip a device makes part of a screen more accessible than others. If we look at this Nordstrom iPad app, the controls are along the left with an easy reach of our thumb. You know, this leaves our right hand free to swipe and tap. Whereas if we look at the Nordstrom iPhone app, it has the same controls running along the bottom of the screen, as this is where our thumb naturally rests when we're gripping the smartphone. You know, the site follows desktop conventions, so we have the navigation right up the top, so it's within our line of sight. We handle each device differently, and the layout should adjust for that. I expect we'll see some email navigations that shift from the top on desktop to vertical on 10-inch tablets. So it's not just the grip, but also reach. When speaking to Engadget, BlackBerry said, We've been doing a lot of stuff to make it really easy to interact with BlackBerry 10 one-handed, so something as simple as moving the URL bar down to the bottom, which you can see here, so that you can tap without having to stretch. So it's no longer about what you can see, but what you can comfortably reach. Now, one study found that 49% of users hold their smartphones one-handed, 36 cradled, and 15% two-handed. The study observed that one-handed users seem to be high, highly one-handed use seems to be highly correlated with users simultaneously performing other tasks. You know, we saw the same behavior earlier on tablets, where eating and drinking is a top secondary activity behind watching TV. So, a typical tablet user is on the couch with the TV on in the background during prime time, eating their dinner with one hand while using the other to navigate. You know, either that or they're half asleep in bed. So let's look at performance. 90% of the tablets in the US were Wi-Fi only in 2012. You know, Wi-Fi strength varies greatly from, say, a busy cafe, different rooms in your home, to, you know, the notoriously bad hotel Wi-Fi. So tablet connection speeds are not as strong or, or as reliable as the desktop, and our file sizes need to reflect that. As for the 10% on cellular, 3G connections are 40% slower than the desktop, and 4G 12%. So, you know, you really need to rethink those retina images. Now, even if you knew that a user was on 4G, they still might not appreciate you using up their data plan. But I do recommend using high-res images for, say, logos or, or other small key images. Now, just make your text HTML and your buttons code, or, you know, basically as much of your design as you can get away with. When I looked at 50 retail emails, I found 258K to be the average weight of the images. You know, any, any images that you do use, just try and make sure that you compress them using tools like Riot or Image Optin. You know, there's also some really interesting compression techniques being discussed here. So does this all mean that you should have tablet-specific media queries? Now, I, I believe there is a discussion right now of a, a pointer media query, which would detect if a device being used is, you know, uses a cursor or a touch, and then you could use that to, to alter your creative. You know, but for now, we design the desktop layout for touch, making sure that our, our copy and our buttons are large enough for tablets, and that our breakpoints encompass smaller 7-inch tablets. You know, it's not an approach that's unique to email, just, just check out the Nike website. Besides image optimization, one of the best ways to improve performance is to adopt a mobile-first approach to responsive design. This is where you deliver a lightweight mobile template first, and then scale up to the desktop layout, only downloading large desktop images or additional content modules as needed. Now, the problem with this technique is that media query support is quite poor on the desktop, so what would happen is that Outlook users would end up with the mobile build. 
There may come a point when so much of your engagement is mobile and tablet-based that the benefits of this approach outweigh your concerns. Most of us just aren't there yet, but I think mobile-first development will become a, a bigger part of the conversation by the end of this year because, you know, mobile growth just shows no signs of slowing down. For the time being, most of us have adopted a, a desktop-first approach to responsive email design, and this means that mobile users inherit all of the desktop assets. For this reason, all desktop emails need to be as lightweight as possible. One downside of, of taking a desktop-first approach is I think it increases the temptation to hide desktop content from mobile users via display none. Now, if you do do this, just be, a, you know, be aware that you'll take a slight performance hit. Though you can take heart that you're not alone, Guy Poggine looked at 347 responsive websites and found that 86% of them have the same file size on desktop versus mobile. Now, ideally, you want to recycle one set of light assets across desktop, tablets, and mobile. Now, I found that designing the mobile view first can help keep things in check. Now, I particularly like how you can evaluate copy length before porting it all to the desktop. I don't do this for every responsive design project. I just decide on a case-by-case -case basis. It's important to note that there are some support gaps for media queries. Android Gmail is the most notable exception. As Outlook also doesn't support media queries, on the desktop we start with a fixed width layout defined in pixels, just the same as we've always done. Then we switch to a responsive layout wherever media queries are supported. Where there is no media query support, like Android Gmail, those users will get the fixed width desktop build. In Android's case, that means only the top left-hand corner of the desktop build is visible. You know, obviously you can scroll for more, so it's important that you optimize that corner and the entire left rail in your desktop build. Now here's one of the Hugo Boss templates in Android Gmail on seven of our Android test devices. You can see that we put some HTML copy in that space, so it shows with images blocked. You know, I call this area the Android preview pane, as it's what you see by default on that first screen. I did a little bit of research into how much it varies across a range of Android devices. From that, I produced what I call the Grid of Grim. It's a Photoshop PSD you can overlay your creative with. Now, obviously, I haven't tested every Android device and, and tablet out there. I just wanted to get a feel for how much the visible area varies. So, for instance, I purposefully put the red badge feature in the main deal in the top left of this responsive template for Daiga. I think of it as a, an amped up vertical pre-header, as it also gets pulled in as snippet text on smartphones. Quickly, speaking of snippet text and, and subject lines, what's shown varies greatly across a range of different Android devices. You know, via the widgets, you can also set up your Android home screen to show your inbox, and it's totally customizable. So you can drag this box to be as wide or as narrow as you like, and it alters the amount of copy that's visible. So I'd recommend sort of front stacking subject lines and snippet text to around 28 characters. So, okay, when I overlay um, the grid of Grimm over my creative, you can see that the red section is in the safe area. Um, so although this template is responsive, the underlying in desktop build is also Android Gmail and tablet friendly. Now here it is on two different Android devices, the S2 and the Galaxy Nexus, and you can just see here that it's pulled in the top left hand corner of the desktop build. And here it is in uh, desktop Gmail. And as you can see, it's a fixed width layout here, so it looks you know, the same as it ever did. Um, and here it is on the iPad. And here it is in the Android client showing the responsive layout. It's in the native build. And here it is in the Gmail client showing the desktop build. And you can see it's just pulling in this corner here. And here's another example. And again, we place the, the hero copy top left in HTML. And that's what you can see by default in the Gmail app in this version. And to the left is the responsive layout. Um, and what happens here is these two columns get stacked into one, and you can also see that the headers have, have changed ever so slightly. You know, one advantage of this two-column layout is if Android Gmail users scroll down, the entire left-hand column fits neatly on the screen. So this is the, in Android Gmail scrolled down a bit, so you can see that although there's no media query support, the desktop layout still works quite well, and you've just got to make sure that you use mobile size copy and buttons. So this post has more Android Gmail tips that you can work into your desktop layout. Simple things like adding a vertical scroll me bar, 
uh, making your pre-header more colourful so that it doesn't blend in with the, the grey UI, or add in styled out text to your logo. So, you know, although the lack of Android Gmail support is a bit of a hassle, it's definitely not a deal breaker. You just have to factor it into your desktop build. You know, making sure your desktop layout works for Android Gmail is something you'll want to do whether your layout is responsive or not. So to recap, your desktop build serves a triple purpose nowadays. Besides working for desktop users, it also needs to be Android Gmail and tablet friendly. You know, and for those devices which do res support responsive design, you can go a step further and enhance the experience. I've found real devices are essential for testing. It just settles my stomach to see my designs on a range of different platforms. Now, today we're 30 though, we didn't go out and, and buy them all at once. Back in 2009, I started out using free tools like IBB Demo. Then I used Device Anywhere for a while, before buying an iOS device and a couple of Androids, and then building up to what we have today. As so much of our work became mobile, adding more devices seemed like a legitimate investment. I'm often asked why a physical lab as opposed to preview tools, so I thought I'd share how I found it useful. You know, if you're designing for touch, it helps to be able to physically interact with the device. Is the spacing right? Does it work for one-handed use? Are the buttons within easy reach? Now, you need to feel how your design holds up. Doing QA on real devices is fast. You know, when we were working on the toggle navigation, we'd do a small tweak send, small tweak send, you know, sometimes with only seconds in between. Now, in the end, we must have sent around 100 tests. The toggle also initially had issues with the links not working and the show hide state getting muddled. You know, it would have been impossible to debug in a static preview tool. As we saw earlier with the, with the read later links in the Rackspace project, being able to test the entire flow on mobile devices is important, you know, from the sign up to the checkout and everything in between. You know, then there was the responsive project where the background image loaded for a second on Android and then disappeared. You know, we never would have caught it as preview tools would have captured the image when it first loaded. You know, also increasingly we're being asked to design responsive landing pages, so we need to be able to test across a range of mobile web browsers and not just email clients. You know, as we already own a bunch of devices, it just doesn't present a problem. Now, performance is often out of sight, out of mind. You know, you really need to test your creative over different connection speeds. You know, Wi-Fi at a busy Starbucks versus in your office. Now, if you just do a Twitter search for slow Wi-Fi, you'll hear how it's slow at school, in certain rooms of the house, and that's before we even get started on hotel or, or conference Wi-Fi. Besides Wi-Fi, we've some devices on 3G and 4G. Admittedly, not as many, though. You can swap out the chips to test different models. Now, data plans are definitely the biggest hassle of setting up a lab. We brought the majority of our devices new and unlocked, which certainly house, but you know it does add to the cost. As we saw with the tablet research, it's important to understand the context in which different devices are used and the types of acti activities we tend to perform on them. You know, why do I prefer a seven-inch tablet for reading in bed? Is it, a, is it that it's more lightweight or gives off less light? You know, how do I hold it when it's half buried in the duvet? And there's so many nuances that you can pick up, little observations, if you're using these devices in your everyday life. So, final thoughts uh, a couple of years in. Responsive email design is imperfect, and there are a number of challenges that are unique to our community, but it's definitely the best we have. I mean, can you imagine trying to deploy five different builds? You know, one HTML file that adapts to, a, to hundreds of devices sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, and while it's certainly not the only mobile email approach, it adds an extra layer of control to your skinny, fluid, dynamic, horizontal, or scalable layout without taking anything away from that core experience. So thanks, and uh, I hope it's been useful, and drop me an email if you have any questions.